Vehicle Dynamics is really a whole course, um, so many topics, and I'm going to try to compress this into, I'm guessing, will need to be roughly three weeks, twice a week, something like that. I'm going to try to tailor it to the off-road applications um, as much as I can, but also make it general so that you have, I'm thinking now particularly for the Baja team, um, or for, for both teams, when you present your approach, you want to speak as a vehicle dynamics expert, not as someone who was um, tailored too narrowly. So it will be both general and specific. I sent some links um, yesterday, and those are just kind of warm up kind of topics to get you going. <coughs> it's hard to know where to start in vehicle dynamics, but uh, a little bit on terminology and a lot on uh, analyzing the car first as a go-kart without suspension, and then we get into the suspension to see how what we learn as a go-kart applies to the suspension. Uh, some real basic terms, wheelbase, front to rear, track from the center of one wheel to the center of the other, and you can have, of course, different tracks in front and rear. Uh, any questions before I actually dive into the uh, first analysis? And so, I've, um, for some of this stuff, I have good lecture notes written um, just in the past couple days. And for other stuff, um, we'll be making it up as I go. But I think it's helpful um, if I not just rely on that because uh, it can be passive. <laughs> but dead. Um, so let, actually, let, before I go into this, uh, let's talk about what are our goals for a race car. So um, a few critical ones. You want to maximize your acceleration capability. So that's going to be a function of the engine, the vehicle, the suspension, the tires, and the road surface. You want to maximize your braking capability, same thing, cornering capability. You don't want to tip over or roll over, which as I've seen in Baja videos is very common. <laughs> uh, what other goals can you think of for a race car, particularly an off-road race car? Aha, uh -huh. okay. Does it get stuck? So is that what goes into not getting stuck? <coughs> Suspension. And, yeah, so what what are the ways it could get stuck, and what are the attributes of the suspension that would prevent it from getting stuck or cause it to be stuck? It can get stuck in like a hole or a ditch, and it can like just dive, and then it gets stuck. So that can depend on the wheel size. Uh huh, yep. So if you have a bigger wheel, you can get over the hump. Right. If it's not really a big con. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure how the suspension really But that's, that's probably the biggest one there, is wheel size. Uh, if you're getting stuck in a rut. Um, you can imagine, so here's your rut, we'll make it even, and here's your car with tiny wheels. So, um, <laughs> so when it gets to be about that size, um, if the wheel cannot drive itself out of the um, the divot, then you have a problem. You also have an issue with, you can imagine, ground clearance, right? If you have that much ground clearance, then that's going to be a lot different than a car that has that much ground clearance. Uh, anything else about getting stuck here? Um, just like, like the like the differential that you said, so like non-slip or long differentials. Uh -huh. So when there's high friction and low friction surfaces, or if there's uh, like mud or some water, which there might be. Yeah. Um, being able to dissipate power to both the right and left wheel. Yeah. Um, so like off -wise. Very good. So that was a differential. How many people got a chance to see the videos I sent? The link. Some of you. Um, so make sure you, you do it at some point, because I think they're really good. The, um, see, in Southern California, we probably don't see this, but if you grew up in a snowy country or ice country, then um, almost all streetcars have what's called an open differential, meaning they can, the, the front wheels or the rear wheels, if it's rear wheel drive, they can both transmit power and they can rotate independently of each other. 
So in that situation, if one wheel is on ice or has low friction, then the other wheel is always limited by the amount of torque that the one wheel can deliver. So if it's on ice, it has no torque or one foot pound. That means this has one foot pound. And that means you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> so when you press the gas harder and you rev the engine up, then the inside wheel just spins. So um, that could get you stuck as well. Yep. What else would make a good off-road race car? Endurance. Endurance, OK. So what goes? What do you mean by endurance? Maximize the, the resistance of the chassis. The what? The resistance. Resistance, OK. Yeah, what about? Materials. Resistance in what sense? We, we, we don't want the chassis to break. To break, OK. Yeah, we don't want physical failure or things falling apart. Yep. What other ways could it um, fail the chassis? It's a really big bump. Um, and we'll bend the chassis or something. Yeah, parts could bend, parts could break, um, shocks could blow out or overheat, tires could fail. Yeah, it's like, like the more leakages and the weaker leakages that you have are like problems. Uh huh. Like there's that one video, like the, I don't know if this is the one you showed us, but one of the cars like hit a bump and it, like, Front wheel is completely like twisting sideways. Yeah. Oh, uh, a Baja SE. Yeah. 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 These take a lot of abuse. The ba I, from watching, I've spent a lot of time watching the videos. And abuse is almost the main criteria you're driving for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, this stuff's important, but this this will make you place well. But in order to finish, they they have to be very well designed. That doesn't necessarily mean heavy, but it will mean carefully engineered and metal in the right places at the right orientation. Anything else you can think of that uh, would go into a good off-road race car? One of the videos um, that I thought was pretty interesting was the sprung versus unsprung mass. Yep. And so keeping your unsprung mass as low as possible mm -hmm. um, seems to be pretty important, mm -hmm. which is everything that is not just the main weight of the body of the car, with the suspension system, the wheels, and everything, keeping that weight as low as possible. Yep. Yep. So we'll talk, that's um, later, probably later today, we'll get into <coughs> sprung versus unsprung, but that was a good intro. Um, and um, the less unsprung, the better your wheel can follow an undulating road. Uh, the more unsprung, then it's like a go-kart, and you hit a bump and the whole car goes flying in the air. Okay, good less. Okay, so initially I'll just be looking at the, the classic questions, acceleration, braking, and cornering. What happens to a vehicle when it goes through these things, and how do we keep it from tipping over? Okay, and a lot of vehicle dynamics is real basic free body diagrams, uh, drawing the right free body diagram, using your statics, applying the statics equations to this, and I'll actually be doing this today because you can learn things from these. So here is uh, classic free body diagram of a car under acceleration. And I'm doing rear wheel drive cars. It's almost all race cars are rear wheel drive. Uh, some are four wheel drive. Uh, the, the difference would be this FR force. So a little subscript R I'm using for rear, little subscript F I'm using for front. Um, these are the normal forces, front and rear. This is the drive force on the rear axle. Or on, on the contact patch. If it was four-wheel driver, you'd have another one here. Uh, you have a center of gravity of the car. It's going to have, of course, a weight vector straight down. That center of gravity has a location, and the location of the center of gravity has a lot to do with the basic performance of the car. Uh, as you probably know, front-wheel drive, front-engine cars are going to have a center of gravity towards the front, and uh, rear-wheel drive cars, if they're rear or mid-engine, will have it towards the back. And that choice of where you put your CG has um, vast implications for handling in many ways. The height of the center of gravity, that's the, that's the H off the ground, that is very important for uh, all three of these, acceleration, braking, and cornering. Um, and I'm going to use these, this is kind of the normal terminology. L is the wheelbase, little b is the distance from front wheel to the CG and little c from the CG to the rear wheel. Uh, and <coughs> ah, yes. So 
here's a trick that almost all the vehicle dynamics analysis does. So we have our car. And it's, let's say, starting out stationary, and then it's going to accelerate that way forward. So the acceleration is this way. I don't know if they taught you this in statics, but it's a nifty trick. You know that some of the forces is equal to ma, and we can make this x or any direction. Uh, if that's true, we can subtract ma from both sides. Some of the forces minus ma equals zero. And when you do it this way, vector or whatever, you can pretend that this minus ma is a force. And it makes the intuitive analysis of vehicle dynamics problems easier. You, you construct a free body diagram, and this is a free body diagram. My acceleration is that way. I pretend that there is an MA force in the opposite direction going that way. And now it's a statics problem because it equals zero. Did they teach you this in statics? So it's an old, so you had it in Spain, uh, our students didn't. It varies by the teacher. It's kind of an old technique, uh, but it happens to be very handy for vehicle dynamics, so that's what I'm gonna do. And so now, you can pretend this car is not moving, not accelerating, just that there's some invisible force grabbing the CG and pushing it that way. Now you can feel that every time you step on the gas in your own car, right? You're in, you step on the gas, you go like that. So, oop, let me put myself here, here I am, step on the gas. That's the MA force on your head going that way. Except this MA force is acting on the whole car, which at this point we're just treating like a go-kart, no suspension. So once you have that, then we can analyze this just like our normal um, statics problems. We have some of the forces. I have this spin up here. I can go so far and then I'll lose my picture. So. Some of the forces in the x direction. So x is this way, y is that way. So we have the ma that's pointed this way. So a common confusion on that ma. Um, minus ma, so you can think of it this way, and maybe this is better, plus m times minus a. So I don't, I don't put a negative sign there, because I've already drawn the arrow that way. The negative sign gets the arrow to go that way, yeah, so you don't, don't, don't do a double negative. So ma is that way. fr is my only force pushing me that way, and that is zero. So acceleration is F over M, as usual. Some of the forces in the vertical. So we have our normal forces, the front and rear contact, NF and NR. We have our MG down, and that's zero. And then the most interesting equation is some of the moments. And so we either pick the front contact patch or the rear contact patch. Doesn't much matter. I did the rear. So if you're sitting at the rear, we have a normal force at the front times its length. Okay, and that one's going around this way, so that's clockwise, so that's a negative sign. Then we have our MA force, so that's gonna be going around this way, that's also clockwise, and so that's also negative. And its moment arm, this is very important, MA times H. So the H is the torque arm of that inertial force that's causing the vehicle to tip. That's what's driving all of the tipping, is the H. That's the height of the center of gravity. Guess what? Good race cars are low to the ground. No surprise. But this is where it shows up. Uh, and then our weight vector, mg times c. And that one is going around this way. That's counterclockwise, so it's positive. OK, so that's 0. Now you work with this equation, and okay, here we go. So I'm just solving for NF and NR um, in this one, and I think I'm combining with some other stuff. I think I combined it with that one. Yep. Uh, and you get 
The normal force on the front is the mass of the car divided by the wheelbase times GC minus AH. Now to interpret that, first look at this, this term. This is MGC divided by L. So MG, you know that's the weight, and then C over L. That's the ratio of that distance to the hole. And so that's the static weight, that term right here. If C were equal to L, then we'd have L over L, and all of the weight would be on the front wheels. That makes sense. Okay, that checks out. Uh, and then we subtract off of that static weight an AH M over L. So let's look at that one. M A H over L. This is called the weight transfer term, or technically the load transfer term. So when you step on the gas and your head goes back and the, the front end of the car starts to lift up, if you have a power enough, powerful enough engine and rear wheel drive and lots of traction, you can get the front end eventually come off of the ground. And dragsters can do that. So that will happen when um, the load transfer is all the way onto the rear wheels and off the front wheels. We're not gonna see that in most cases on dirt, but um, that, that helps you think of what's happening. So that's the front. The rear is very similar. You see it's all the same except for a plus. So it's just the static weight, well, sorry, plus and a B. So the static weight now goes by B, not by C. That makes sense. If, the, if B was equal to L, all the weight would be on the rear wheel. And AH is our load transfer term. Okay. Typical values for those. Front engine, front wheel drive, that's 90% of the cars on the road. 60% front, plus or minus some, or uh, 40% rear. A mid-engine rear-wheel drive car, typically about 55% front. Nope, oh, that's wrong. Mid-engine rear-wheel drive, 45% front. 55% rear. And a... Um, uh, let's see, a rear engine car, like a Porsche 911, that would be 40% front, 60% rear. And if you have a lot of power, like a trophy truck, you want to get as much weight on that rear as possible. And that's going to be for traction. Uh, or for a dragster. Um, actually, dragsters are extreme. That They probably have 10% on the front, 90% on the rear. I'm not sure. I can look that up. Is the ball car pretty heavy on the back? Um, Bajas, the numbers I've seen in the forums range between 45, 55, the competitive ones, um, and 40, 60. So no. the more we can get to the back, the better? Depends on your design. Good question. There are two approaches, this from what I've read so far. Uh, and it, it comes down to spool or differential. Okay. Spool or differential covers a lot of different decisions in the car, so, which is why I brought it up so soon. Uh, the, the spool cars actually want less weight on the back, so you can slip those rear tires easier. Uh, if you have a differential, um, that's not an issue, and so you want to get as much weight as possible so you have more traction. Does the differential take away from power? Like, not really. Yeah, it shouldn't. Um, transmission would, depending on your transmission. Like a CVT definitely takes away from power. Most people still run it because it is um, so easy to drive that advantage makes up for its lack of power. But the differential itself shouldn't take any power. So, you know, so this, this fundamental weight distribution has a big effect of the, all of the things being equal and assuming, take the spool out of it for now. Um, the more weight on the front of the car means that that's the end of the car that will lose traction first. So front wheel drive cars always go off the road head first. Rear, uh, rear engine cars usually go off the road tail first. Um, and I had a 911 a long time ago, and I can tell you that that's true. <laughs> um, they're, it's not the greatest solution. Um, Mid-engine cars will go off the road um, usually tail first as well, because they have a little more rear weight. Okay, let's see. 
So we want to do a couple things. Now that we have those equations, one thing we want to do, in particularly an off-road car, is maximize rear traction. And we would want to maximize rear traction for acceleration and just to get out of problems. You know, if we're in a, if we're in a ditch and we got like silt under our wheels, we want to be able to get out of it. So that says we want to maximize this force on the rear contact patch. Okay. The maximum force on the rear contact patch is the coefficient of friction between the, the tire and the dirt, or whatever it is, times the normal force on that wheel. And this is one where I don't have a lot of expertise for dirt. You are. Uh, for for uh, asphalt and cement, those things are well known, well published. Uh, I think it's similar, but I don't know for sure yet. So. I want to say that as a caveat. So we want to maximize this. That means we want to maximize both that and that. Let's first look at the normal force. How do we get the most normal forces possible on that rear contact patch? So for the static case, that's simple. You just want to get the center of gravity over the rear wheels. That's obvious. For the dynamic case, it does get more complicated. So in other words, for acceleration. So let's see, we want to, in order to maximize acceleration, you remember way back, well you just know F, F equals MA, therefore A is F over M, therefore the lighter vehicle will have more acceleration. Seems reasonable. Uh, we want also to maximize that FR. Uh, we know that's mu, the coefficient of friction times the normal force on the rear tires, okay? And we, we solve for that above. That was M over L, the wheelbase, GB plus the weight transfer, so static weight plus weight transfer. <coughs> so look at this equation, and that says in order to maximize that, then we want to get our B. We still want the weight over the rear wheels. We want maximum B. Uh, notice the weight transfer term, A, H. The H, if you increase H, the height of the center of gravity with a rear-wheel drive car, you do get more traction. It's a positive. However, you don't want to use that height so much that you pop a wheelie. <laughs> then you can't steer. Um, so, just because they're cool, I'll show one. There's so many great videos. <laughs> Here's dragsters popping awesome. really. You hear that? It's perfect. Look at now, that. dragsters, I don't want you to be too um, influenced by this because drag tires are totally different than off road tires. These, it, um, their surface is not really concrete. It's laid down rubber. It's hot rubber. And it's rubber that's super stick and sticky and soft. They have coefficients of friction between, for a top fuel dragster, I've heard the coefficient of friction between the tire and the, the quote road is four or five. And in engineers, we almost never see something that's more than one. And in street cars, uh, street tires are typically about 0.9. You know, a, a high performance street car tire will be one. <laughs> or 1.1, uh, but th these guys are up in the five category. They also have infinite power, a top fuel dragster. <laughs> Essentially, they do. Um, I think it's like four or 5,000 horsepower. Yeah. Some goes up to 9,000. 9,000? Yep. Wow. That's really hard. Yeah. It, so the question is just how do you get that down to the ground? Uh, now, these aren't top fuel, but they do have pretty much the same um, tires. So they love wheelies, of course. But you can you can imagine in the wheelie situation, all of that weight of the car is sitting on the rear tires. So a, a dragster, in order to um, accelerate as much as possible, they want to get 99% of the weight on the rear tires and just enough weight on the front tires to steer. That's the goal. And so if you're shooting for 99, it's not hard to sometimes hit 100. Let's see, 
So how do we, we want to get the weight on the rear wheels, but we don't want to wheelie. So what, how do we do that? We need to have some dimension C that's greater than zero. So I'm saying that because that's this distance here. So we want the, the center of gravity to be close to the rear wheels, but not over the rear wheels, because then we have no ability to accelerate without popping the wheelie. And or we want a small h. So the usual conclusion is for maximum acceleration, your CG wants to be somewhat in front of the rear wheels and as low as possible. That will give you maximum traction. It'll give you a some weight transfer, so you can get most of the weight on there um, in acceleration, but it won't cause a wheeling. That's the low CG part. Let's see, you can also think of this, the same equations show up very similarly when you're climbing a hill, and I know that's one of the um, competitions. So you want a lot of traction to be able to get up a hill, particularly if it's um, uh, not much grip. And let's see, we, we don't want to tip over, we want to tip over backwards going up the hill. So, so far this is all, this, I started with a, with a free body diagram that did not have either downforce or aerodynamic drag. Now Baja, those forces will be insignificant, but trophy trucks, they're, they're definitely significant. And so if you have downforce, then it's like putting a down arrow here, a force, and a down arrow here, or if you have lift, which is worse, then it's up arrows. Uh, if you have drag, then it's a force going like that. The drag vector will automatically put more force on the rear wheel than the front of X, just like the MA does. The downforce depends on relative distribution. So the aerodynamic designer will um, try to usually get both front and rear downforce, but they usually want more rear to keep the car more stable. If your rear gets loose, that's much more of a problem than if your front gets loose. Uh, now, there's a, sometimes a confusion, at least in lay people, they think there's like this um, saying that goes around, um, don't you want more weight so you can get the tires to grip more? What's wrong with that thinking? Why don't, if some people think you want a heavy car to get the tires to grip more. Well, it also contributes to your MA force. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they do grip more. They have more pounds on them, but they have to work harder because they have to manage a bigger M. So it doesn't help you. And as it turns out, it hurts you what I'll talk about in a bit why. Uh, what hurts certainly for your engine only has so much power, but it also hurts um, traction, as we'll see in a little bit there. Okay. Let's see, how about, so that was acceleration. Let's look at braking. Braking is a lot like acceleration with one big exception. All four wheels can brake on any car. So that's gonna change some of our things. Uh, this one I didn't, I thought I did scan this. No, I didn't scan it, sorry. Um, it's a very similar free body diagram. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But the difference would be in braking, the MA force goes in the other direction, because now it's a deceleration. And so this is like you put on the brake and uh, you can feel your head go forward. So that's the MA force in braking going that way. This flips. The FR swip flips direction, and you have a new force at the front. Oh, I didn't mention before. When you did these sum of the moments equations, uh, if you sum about the contact patch, which is most typical, notice that, the, that these forces always go right through. They have no moment contribution. Okay, so when you do braking and you run through the numbers, some things change. Let's see. You still want minimum mass. Now you have two wheels. You want to maximize both the front braking force and the rear braking force. And then we break those down into two terms. There's the, the coefficient of friction of the front times the normal friction, normal force on the front, the coefficient of friction of the rear, and the normal force on the rear. Now here's the thing about um, tires that is important. And this is where my knowledge of the off-road tires is weak. I need to, I 
need to learn more. But for street tires, anytime you have rubber on anything hard, that coefficient of friction is not constant. When you took statics, you, they just gave you a coefficient of friction, right? And you just wrote down F friction equals mu N. And mu is always constant. That is not true for uh, tires. What, what we see in tires is, is that mu is a function of the normal force. And here's a typical graph of a, this would be a, a racing tire. Uh, it's got a, so this is coefficient of friction. With no weight on it or one kilogram on it, it has a coefficient of friction of almost 1.5. So that would be a pretty nice race tire. Probably like, a, maybe like an Indy tire or something like that. Um, as long as you have low weight, that coefficient of friction stays pretty constant, pretty flat up here. But as soon as you get more and more weight, you so to speak overload the tire, the coefficient of friction is dropping. So you're overloading the tire and it can't give, <coughs> it can't give you back as much grip as it could if it were lightly loaded. So that, we need to now think about this equation right here. We want to maximize this, front and rear, mu n, and we have a graph that goes like this. Okay, so let's say um, we have a car that's 50-50 weight distribution. And let's say that car weighs 200 kilograms. No, uh, sorry, four, let's say the car weighs 200, 400 kilograms on each axle. And therefore, um, on the front you have 200 and on the rear you have 200. Then both your front and rear tires are sitting right there. They have that much friction capability. You put on the brakes, now you're putting more load on the front tires, less load on the rear tires. So the front tires might be seeing 300, and the rear tires might be seeing 100. Now, when you look at a graph that has this kind of shape, um, the important thing is that the higher loaded tire, the front tires, have less friction capability. So if you're trying to maximize mu front in front plus mu in you rear, sorry, rear in rear. Uh, the one that you look, that you care most about is is the. There's two terms here. The term we care most about is the one where the end's the biggest. That's the front. That means uh, this one that has 300 kilograms on it has a smaller end. So you're losing braking capability by overloading the front tires. It's not a. It's not a um, even trade. It started out 50-50, and, um, you, and you had good high friction on both of them, but when you, over, when you put more weight to the front of the car, you lose more there than you gain in the back. So, like, or another way to say is, the friction only goes up a tiny bit to there, but it goes down more, and that's a bigger end. So, that says we want to um, let's see. If we want to maximize the, the mu and the braking performance, then this is the conclusion. We want more B and less H. And that makes sense. We want to see the center of gravity um, more towards the back, not 50-50. And again, we don't want H. H is causing more weight transfer, and that's um, hurting our acceleration, or our deceleration. Let's see. Questions so far? This, I think, this graph takes a while to kind of digest. Yeah. Where do you usually, where do you typically put the brakes? Is it on every tire, or just on the front? Or? Yeah, four wheel. Yeah, almost all cars will have four wheel braking. Um, the brakes on most cars are outboard, in other words, by, by on the wheel. Some cars have brakes inboard. If they have a drive shaft coming in, then they can put the, the brake there, but it's still acting um, on that wheel. Okay. I've read there's like a primary and a, like a primary and like a sub. Secondary, secondary circuit? Yeah, so how does, how does that work? Um, 
Well, there's dual diagonal. That's the most yeah. common. So uh, that's kind of confusing me. So the, the front left and the back right are connected. Yeah. So the, the, we're gonna, this is, um, let's see. So here we have this kind of off our train here, but it's a good question. How does that breaking circuit actually work? Uh, in streetcars, and I think in um, Baja SAE, I don't know about trophy trucks. They might have a more classic racing uh, system. In streetcars, you have a master cylinder here. And you have a, another master cylinder. The rod goes all the way through. There's a seal there, and there's another piston. So there's hydraulic fluid that's pressurized here, and there's also hydraulic fluid pressurized here. So it's a dual circuit for safety. And what's done is this circuit is plumbed to those wheels, and the red circuit is plumbed to the others. The, the rationale here for safety is that if you lose one circuit, then now you have braking on front and rear. You're not braking only the front or only the rear. That's important because um, well, so it's different than race cars. Race cars have, and I probably trophy trucks, but I'm not sure. Race cars still have two um, cylinders, but they are arranged side by side. Cylinder, fluid. Okay. Then they have what's called a balance bar, and then your pedal pushes somewhere on that balance bar. And so these have a front circuit and a rear circuit. And the idea here is that uh, you can fine tune by, by moving your brake force along this balance bar, you can push more or less on the front circuit or the rear circuit. And the goal is to get them to both lock up at almost exactly the same time. That's giving you your maximum brake force. And for safety, what's done is you make the fronts lock slightly before the rear. If the front slides, that's a safe situation because the rear rows are still steering and rolling. If the, front, um, if the front's rolling and the rear locks up, that's not a safe situation because now it's going to fishtail. So race cars are done this way to maximize braking performance. But this is not done in a streetcar because it's risky. If you lost the rear circuit, you're fishtailing. In this design, if you lose either circuit, you don't fishtail. It's going to uh, perform a little oddly. It's going to pull to one side or the other, but it'll be safer than that. I'm assuming we want to go with the one on the left because it's. I think you have to. I think the Baja rules require dual diagonal. So they emphasize safety, but all yeah. else. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, I would assume trophy trucks are done this way. <laughs> okay. So you, if you've raced a lot, and you probably no, they don't brake balance in their trophy truck. They What's have, that? They have brake balance. In the they do. Truck. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good question. Um, other questions on this maximized braking force thing? I know if this is, in some sense, I'm. It might seem kind of um, like I'm going a little over analytical, but um, two things. One is this is an engineering class, so I don't want you to be able to do this. Um, it's not a garage project. And two is you, I'm starting with these because this kind of analysis you use over and over and over in racing. And it's not hard stuff, but you need to be good at it so you can do it. I have a quick question yeah. on the braking. I read on a couple of forums that um, like one of the most common failures that a lot of these cars see um, is braking. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for them to get it to like work. Mm -hmm. um, do you know are the, what are some of the common things that usually go wrong with the braking system? Is 
Do you know off the top of your head, are there some big issues to look out for? Or? In Baja, I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen, I haven't searched for that yet. Um, but in, let's see, you can have calipers um, seize up or leak. The caliper is the thing that grabs the brake rotor. Uh, you can have rotors that um, pulsate. They actually don't, it's a common misperception, the rotors are not warped. When you press, press a brake pedal and you feel boop, 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 that's not a warped rotor. It's um, that the friction is changing around the, uh, the circumference of the rotor. You have high friction parts and low friction parts. Uh, it's because the brake pad got deposited on it, and that causes the pulsing. Uh, and that tends to make people not want to brake as hard. Um, you can certainly have the balance wrong. Like if you choose the wrong diameters of these cylinders and these cylinders, then you can have some wheels lock up and before others. Okay. Have to look at those. Yeah, cool look at them. Brakes are usually pretty reliable if you do them well. Okay. So that if they're not doing it, that's what they didn't do well. Okay. <laughs> also, you said brakes are more the chassis too. I usually consider chassis. Uh, that's because the brake. Let's see. Oh, so, sorry. The, they're considered. They're definitely not considered powertrain. Uh, that would be the last choice. Whether they're considered suspension or inner chassis, that's kind of a toss-up. Since the caliper is out, the rotor and the caliper is out here. Um, that those objects have an influence on how you design your suspension, a pretty big one, because they're in the way. And so it makes more sense for these parts to be part of the suspension team. These cylinders are part of the pedal package, right? So you're pushing on a pedal, yeah. there's what's called a pedal package, the braking, accelerator, and mid-clutch if you have that. And so the pedal package is technically part of the inner chassis team. So, um, that's an argument for that part to be there. However, they have to have, they both share the same hydraulic fluid and the same pressure. <laughs> so the people have to work together closely. One way to, to manage it is that um, I would make the, the suspension team responsible for this and the diameter of this cylinder, just the diameter, because that'll determine the pressure on it. And the chassis team is responsible for everything else about the what if you took just completely removed any external braking, like had it completely internal? Like the, the, the braking pads or whatever, like internal, would that, would that make it easier to suspension? I'm not sure what you mean by internal external. Well, you mentioned earlier, you can have the... Um, inboard? Yeah, inboard. Oh, inboard, so, yeah. That's okay. Uh, so so inboard, would that make it easier for suspension design? Or is there still... No, it would, yeah. It can only, on the front, it cannot be done unless you have four-wheel drive. Okay. Right. It makes no sense to put a drive shaft in just for braking. Totally. It's way too much work. Okay. Uh, on the rear, yes, it, uh, inboard brakes do make sense um, and are often done in race cars. Uh, it does give you more room to package stuff out here and it'd be a better cooling off in here. It's not shielded by the wheel. Yeah. As soon as you had inboard on the rear. Uh huh. Yep. If you have a spool, a spool mean a spool differential means that it's a solid shaft connecting both sides. Then you only need one brake. Yeah, that's another nice thing. In fact, sometimes they put the brake wherever they want. They might put the disc here and the chain there. That's very common in some race cars that have spools. Chain on one side. If you put it in the middle, the shaft will have too much stretch. Uh, if you have a, to, uh, a very intense torque. Yeah, it doesn't much matter. Um, so his question is, don't you want it in the middle so that you have even amounts of um, deflection. The shafts are so stiff compared to the tires that it's, it's basically insignificant. The tires are going to slip. They have a, they're designed to slip on the road surface. So you know you might see one degree of, of twist in the axle, and that where the tires are many many degrees. Okay. Other questions on braking? I just had a quick one about the pulsating. You said brake, the brake pad sometimes gets deposited on the rotor. How does yep. that happen? Um, bad compound material, bad brake. The, the pad material was not designed for, it got too hot and it, and it um, let out something. 
if you have the right pad material, it shouldn't do that. It can be caused by a bad um, break in, too. The first time you use the pads, you have to break them in. My car had it, a uh, Honda, and it happened whenever I would. Um, I didn't know why <laughs> until I read up on it. Uh, when I was um, high speed stop, so like 60 to zero, and then leave your foot on there. Now you have hot pads on a rotor, and that hot pad is um, outgassing stuff, and that gets put on the rotor. So the one trick is you just let up on the brake a little bit, creep the car forward, and then you don't have one spot where it's left on. It's a very common misperception that the pulsating is a warp. It's not what usually the warp is on iron. It's not the bus. Okay, let's see. Anything else I'm breaking here? Oh, we don't want to tip over. So let's see. So um, we want to not tip over. That The tip over condition occurs when the rear force in R goes to zero. And um, that occurs when this is the acceleration. And so to maximize acceleration at that condition, you want more B and less H. I think I said that already. Uh, and the way to get more B is a more longer wheelbase. That's the best way. So in, in braking, uh, a very long wheel, usually you can't drop your CG much. It's just you know, the engine can only go so low, the driver can only go so low. Um, and so the way you get better braking is a longer wheelbase. So far we've done front and back. I was going to do um, lateral next, but uh, let's take any other questions we have on acceleration and braking before we go into lateral, because that's a whole other can of worms. Anything on acceleration? I don't know if this has to do with acceleration, but uh, in the videos with the uh, cars to the up, they have really wide wheels, like yeah. uh, the rear yeah. the skinny wheels in front. Is yeah. that, what is that? Yep. Um, so this this curve here, the the tire curve, this this one, um, they are trying to push it out further. And, so, and once again, this is my knowledge of street cars versus dirt cars. I, so I'm a little hesitant here. Um, if you have, let's say, a tire that is um, eight inches wide then it might have a curve like that. This is mu, this is n. And if you, so this is the eight inch wide tire. A, um, a 10 inch or 12 inch wide tire might have a curve, it'll start the same because it's the same rubber compound. But the wider the tire, the less it's gonna dip down. So a dragster wants to have maximum coefficient at very high end. So big wide tires. Is that just because the larger tire is like inherently more load bearing capacity? I, it must come, to, I haven't researched the rubber properties, but it must come down to how the rubber conforms to the road service. Yeah. It sucks it up. <laughs> if you, yeah, if you, and, and drags tires are, like I said, not like street tires because they're not, it's not rubber and asphalt, it's rubber and rubber. You know, they've done so many burnouts and they intentionally that they've laid out a strip of rubber as their basis. Uh, but there's something about how one piece of rubber molecule touches another rubber molecule that when um, the load is higher, it just slips easier. Yeah. So that would get into like physics over the science building. Uh, one question on the yeah. wheelbase. Are there any um, cons to consider for having a longer wheelbase? Yes. yes. Or should we just take like the rules and take the max wheelbase no. and use that? Yeah. So that's, please don't design a car from what I said so far. <laughs> 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 because um, everything in the above dynamics is going to be a compromise. Yeah. Uh, there are good compromises and bad compromises. Uh, longer wheelbase will hurt maneuverability. That's the biggest thing. So that I've noticed in the Baja courses, some of those turns are super tight. Yeah. Um, you know, five foot radius. Not really new turn. Yeah, and so the longer the wheelbase, two problems. One, it won't have that tight turning radius. And two, it's just a bigger car to fit in the course. Uh, 
So it hurts you in two ways. Yeah. So that's one where I, I want I want you and the judges are going to want you if you're Baha to know why you made decisions. But in terms of the decision you make, you're probably going to want to copy successful cars. <laughs> and then if you tweak it, you know, if you tweak it one direction or another, at least you are conscious of what you're doing. Okay. That's what the judges will expect. Uh, that, that, to me, that's the best answer. You certainly don't want to say, uh, never ever say, my advisor told me to do it. Um, that will go down. That's, a, that's the second worst answer you can give to a question. The worst answer is, um, it's not working, I don't know, or, oh yeah, well, actually copying is maybe a little better than I told you. Okay. Uh, but the worst answer is, I don't know, or I haven't thought about it. Uh, they want to see thinking. They want to see your thinking, and they want to see your thinking based on evidence. So that evidence can be what cars have done well, and um, what are the vehicle dynamics. We had a nice talk about breaking other issues and trying to think of other things that have to do with acceleration. Um, maybe we would just touch a little bit. This FR, for a trophy truck, you got 800 horsepower. <laughs> you have no problem generating that FR with any gearing. Any transmission is not going to matter. Um, there's, they can probably break those tires loose, I would guess, up to 100 miles an hour. Uh, I'm just guessing. Uh, but for Baja, you got 10 hor 9 horsepower. Um, yeah. <laughs> nine horsepower at the engine, then the CVT is going to lose 20, 30 percent in some cases. Um, it's about 90 percent best case. The rest of the transmission will be pretty efficient. So you've got um, six or seven horsepower at the wheel. So your gearing is going to be a big deal. Getting the gearing right, and that, um, as I read more about, it, I think the transmission is a bigger deal than I thought it was. Uh, since it's uh, it's a low speed course. Top speed, I think, is um, 35 typically, from what I read. And uh, there's a lot of hairpin turns. So the problem is how do you get that horsepower to generate a big FR? And that means a lot of reduction. That means, um, let's see, so like on a, on a bicycle, uh, on a bicycle's opposite. So the engine is going. Here's the engine. It's going 3,600 RPM maximum. That, there's a governor for that. And here's your rear wheel. If the rear wheel went 3,600 RPM maximum, that would be like 80 miles an hour. <laughs> so we need to have, in a very simplified sense, a, a reduction gear to slow the rear wheel down. So that's done. For the chain, you do it by a small sprocket here and a big sprocket here. But um, <coughs> the issue with that is that this sprocket would have to be, I think the overall reductions I was reading, this would have to be like a one inch sprocket, and that would have to be a 10 inch sprocket, 10 to one. For, for th if you want the rear wheel to max out at 35 miles per hour, when the engine is at its maximum, I think it's about a 10 to one ratio ballpark. Uh, and this is not practical. You cannot do this with um, sprockets. And it's even hard with gears. So uh, that's because this is just too small for a, a sprocket to exist. Uh, so the most you can do with a sprocket reduction is about 5 to 1. And that's also true for gears. So that means that you're going to need a, what's called a double reduction. So you, you go from little sprocket to five times bigger sprocket, but on the same shaft, you have another little sprocket going to five times bigger sprocket. Um, and that will give you, uh, no, that will give you 25 to one, sorry. Um, so maybe you do like one to three, and one to three or four, or something like that. That will give you 10 to one. So that is a little involved. Uh, so the, the point of this is that, let's see, uh, now I have to get a power train, but this kind of maybe taking us away too far. But suffice it to say, you will have to choose your gear ratios carefully, and that's to maximize that FR. 
So this is all just by putting in the CVT that's always changing. Mm -hmm. The CVT, I think, is good for about three to one. Um, the CVT, so CVT is constant, um, continuous, continuously variable transmission. Continuously variable transmission. CVT. And it has these. Um, So you can see right now, I think I think the max ratio is about three to one. Um, so one inch here, three inch here, something like that. But then the other side of the ratio is typically about one to one, maybe a little bit of what they call overdrive, where this is bigger and that's smaller. But I don't know a lot about CVTs. So you can get some of it from that, but I think they still end up needing to have, do they still need 10 to one on top of the CVT? I'm not sure. I haven't read it now. But it sounded, almost every car I saw did not have one. They either had a gearbox, which lets you do this stuff internally, or they had double chains. See all the gearboxes, and it looks like the ratios are like 10.1 to like 13.2. Uh-huh, yep. Yeah. That's kind of a number I saw too. So, so you need both the gearbox and CVT? Um, right, if you did the CVT alone, you'll need something else. But if you just did your own like custom gearbox with like a two step thing, you right? Need a CVT. Yeah, you could do a manual transmission. I've seen some cars um, use. Um, typically, you don't do your own. You get a motorcycle transmission and cobble it in, um, and um, then you could probably get enough reduction just right in the in the gearbox itself. Maybe it depends on how it's made. Um, let's see, but most people seem to say that the the driver skill required to operate a gearbox in this kind of a course, super tight, you know? Um, but for those that didn't see the, how many people have been you know, on the Baja teams? How many people have seen a Baja course? Okay, but I mean the videos, yeah. So I mean, the, that maneuverability course video I showed you, that was very tight. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got a half second to make the turn. Uh, and so shifting, <laughs> it seemed, the conclusion seemed to be that um, it, would, it meant that your driver skill had to be so much higher. Yeah. So if you did so with the CVT, you would also put another. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so there would be engine um, here. Yeah. Usually the um, the CVT CVT is done right off the engine. Yeah. And then. Um, So I think it's CVT, one reduction, two reduction. That seemed to be what I saw. Um, it could be wrong. So, that, so that's like kind of, but isn't the CVT already like a one to three? Yeah, yeah. So maybe they, you know, it's, I'm reading posts, and so um, maybe this was the, the, maybe this still needs to be 10 to one, even with that three to one. Oh, I'm okay. not sure. Oh, let's see. Okay. I'm really not sure. How does the open school play into that? Not really. Um, the, the, the spool will just determine, so this is the final, the wheel diameter. The spool or the differential just determines how are those left and right wheels turning relative to each other. Oh, okay. But the, the average speed is just covered by that. So with the spool, left and right are always turning the same. With the differential, left and right, can the right can turn faster than the left, and so forth, vice versa. 
so the, so the, I think the, and the, oh, the other question is whether you need a reverse gear. Uh, some cars have it and some don't. It looked like some of the courses were so tight that if the driver made a mistake and you didn't have reverse, what are you going to do? You know, but the reverse, some, some drivers would get themselves into trouble and then get out of it by being able to back up. And so um, I think they make reverse boxes. Uh, you know, forward, it's called a def in our box, forward neutral reverse box. And um, I think Polaris makes them, a couple hundred bucks probably, uh, or people can do their own. Most teams said that doing your own transmission is um, is a lot of work and high risk. The successful teams do it because they've been doing it for so long they can get it right. But a first year team, that'd be a, that'd be a high risk competition. Okay. Okay. So acceleration. Let's see if there's anything else on acceleration. So the trophy truck, not limited air. Baja, uh -huh, we've got to think a lot about how to get the most that far. Okay, cornering. Oh, should we take a break? We'll be, uh, it's an hour and 15. We'll take a break. Bye, kids. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on small versus virtual? Um, they're very different cars. Because on that, like, that maneuver on the video, video on that you show, like, the, um, School can make sense. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of the other aspects of the competition, um, I feel, I don't know, like the rock crawl or any of those other things where your wheels are in stuck in different positions. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking dif differential between uh, It's a lot more versatile. In, like, I don't know. Seven. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, um, my, my first intuition is like definitely yeah. differential. But yeah. The car that had the school performed yeah. better in that. In that. Yeah. In that video you said the school car was clearly faster. So one point on, no matter which um, subsystem you're on, powertrain or inner chassis or suspension, um, this level of knowledge everyone needs to know. Because it turns out that all the decisions affect each other. So if you're in the powertrain team and your job might just be the differential or it might be just the transmission, believe it or not, this level of discussion will affect you. And so, so that you can, um, we need the engineers to be knowledgeable about the other subsystems so that when you have a group discussion, you can make the best collective decisions for your car. So you don't, there's going to be compromises. You, can, you need to be able to know like how important is your subsystem issue compared to the importance of someone else's subsystem issue. If you don't have the, that appreciation, then you're just shouting at each other uh, and the louder person wins. But if you do understand each other's issues, both of you can make the right decision for the car. Okay, so quartering. Uh, this is not too different from the kind of uh, plots we made before, you can see. Um, in some ways it's simpler, some ways it's not. The simpler part is that the center of gravity is in the middle of the car on almost all cars, uh, not circle cars. NASCARs actually put more weight on the inside, but um, any other car is going to have the center of gravity right in the middle. So that means that the B and C dimensions, we get those. You just have T, and it's T divided by 2 for the position. We still have an H. That's the very same H it was before uh, for the um, center of gravity height and the other axis. We still have our ends. I'm using inside and outside, uh, so we don't have a confusion on rear and right, same subscript. So. Uh, oh, so convention for cornering analysis is NASCAR. Left turn and looking at the car from the rear. So left turn. Left turn. And rear view. So I will do all my pictures according to that convention. Um, not everyone on the web will follow that, but most of the race car people do. So let's see. So if we are going around, a, so you're, you're, the, you're the driver, and you're going around a turn like this, then you feel your head go to the outside. The acceleration is towards the inside, right? That's the centrifugal acceleration necessary to keep you turning left. So the acceleration vector is inside by v squared over r. The minus ma force is that way. 
And so that's the force that you feel, your head feels, pushing you to the outside of the car. And so now we can look at it just like another statics problem. We have our two normal forces. Now we have both an inner um, lateral friction force and an outer lateral friction force. The inner one it has an inner coefficient of friction times its normal force, less than or equal to, similar for the outer. That's the diagram. If you have down force, then you have additional forces pushing down. Um, so the ends would go up, but the mg would not. That's the beauty of downforce, is you get n, but you don't have to pay for it with mg. Um, some of the forces in the x direction, oh, that's the y, sorry. Fix these now. So that's just like before. Some of the forces in the lateral direction, uh, NA and the two forces. Therefore, your lateral acceleration is the forces divided by the mass. And so if you are at the very limit, if your car is sliding, it's, it's broken, or it's right at the maximum of its um, static friction, then the acceleration is going to be equal to that coefficient times the normal, that coefficient times the normal divided by mass. And so this is very similar to the braking case. Remember this? You have that same issue, mu n, mu n. And remember how we wanted both tires to be equally loaded? The same thing is going to be true in order. So we're here. Uh, if you sum the moments about the outside wheel, Inside force is the static weight, mg over 2, minus the weight transfer term. So it's the ma force, so to speak, times h, that's the lever arm of that force, divided by track width. So static weight minus the load transferred. And that load that's transferred, this mah over t, that load comes off of the inside wheel and goes onto the outside wheel. Okay, so it's a minus for the inside and a plus for the outside, same term. Uh, if you, I tried working through this and I only got so far. Uh, if you try to solve for acceleration, uh, one thing you notice, so I did this by taking this equation, acceleration is mu n, mu n over m, and then you see these normal. I solve for the NIs and the NOs. That's here's NI, here's NO. So all I did was substitute those NIs back up into this one. And um, I only got so far last night by midnight, so I stopped. Um, but what you do see is that, let's see, here's the first substitution. The Ms, there's an M, an M, an M, an M, and M divided by M. So the mass cancels. So the first order um, analysis says that acceleration is not a function of mass, the lateral acceleration. But in practice it is, and it is because of the mu's. The more mass, the more normal force, the mu's are going to go down. Um, 
the other thing to see about this term is that uh, now this is yeah, like I said, I only got so far. I skipped and moved on. It's not. I don't think the outcome of this is critically important. Um, the, the key things are you want less mass to get those to be high. The other key thing is to recognize this load transfer term, AH um, over T, is what comes off the inside wheel, goes on to the outside wheel. Okay, so let's see. If we want, if we want to maximize lateral acceleration, uh, and that's also maximizing cornering speed because of this B squared over R. So you want them for a given course, that is your given um, radius of curvature of the turn, or the driver's path, that's driver skill, we played that as well. Um, oh, we should talk about that. Uh, we want to maximize our V, and that means maximize the lateral acceleration A, which means we want um, that A to be high. And the way to do that is to keep the two normal forces as equal as possible to maximize the mu, exactly the same as in braking. And the way we do that is by keep your mass low, keep your H as low to the ground as possible, and keep your track width as wide as possible. I've done just in, in and of this own analysis, those are the conclusions. Um, the track width question has other problems to it, which we'll get into. And down forces, you get free, so to speak, force. You don't have to manage it. A brief word, since we, I mentioned it, the V squared R and the A. So this is where driver skill comes into it. And what's called the racing line. So if you have a horse, <coughs> I'll do a very simple turn here. Okay, let's say that's the road. And let's say you have to stay on the road. Um, like there's walls or something. So you have a ch few choices for how you're going to negotiate the turn. One of them is like that. If you do that, then that's the portion where you're doing the turn. And that's the radius of curvature. Now, most cars, like a, let's say it's a street car, your lateral acceleration is going to be less than or equal to about 0 0.9 g's gravities. So uh, that's the limitation on A just based on the design of the car. Uh, if it's a uh, off-road car on dirt, then that's probably going to be, I'm just guessing here, a half a g. That would be optimistic probably for dirt might be a lot less than that. So if, let's say you're at the limit. That means the acceleration is 1 half g. You know that that is also v squared over r. OK. So your v is equal to the square root of um, 1 half gr. No. Yes, yes. Yeah, GR. Okay. Yep. Okay, so if we want to go fast through this, we want to, we've got a high speed coming into the corner. V equals high. We want a high speed coming out of the corner. Uh, we don't want to have to break more than we need to, and we don't want to have to accelerate it more than we need to. So we want this speed right here be as high as possible. So if you want that to be high, we're not going to do anything about gravity, but we want the R to be high. So what the race driver does is they don't drive this line. Um, what do they do? Upside down. Yeah. So they look for the biggest arc that will fit in this course. Now the car has a certain width. So um, let's say the car is that wide. Let's see the car is that wide there. They look for the biggest arc. Well, they know that they're going to, this is called the apex of the turn. They know they're going to have the inside of the car right on the apex of, um, at that point of the turn. 
Actually, but these probably even be bigger. Um, no, that's not really right. Let's see. Let's see the wire. Okay. So now instead of this radius of curvature, we have this radius of curvature. So a good race driver will, will look for that widest possible line, given that biggest arc, and so what they're trying to do is maximize their V. So that minimizes the amount of braking they have to do coming into the corner, maximizes speed through, and um, what's usually considered as important is the exit speed. Uh, because the exit speed determines, as soon as you finish the corner, then you put the gas on again, that determines your entire speed down the next straightaway. So if you have a long straightaway, they're, they're often trying to look for that top exit speed. Okay. So let's see, so this set relates to track width, because the wider the car, the narrower the R. So if I have a car that's, this I'll just be extreme. If your car is that wide, <laughs> then you're gonna have to follow this dotted black line. So that's one of the trade-offs. they're purely cornering and then somewhere around here they start to get on the gas again and so it's combined acceleration and quartering and so how does that work and the key concept here is called the friction circle so we think of we think of the tire It has a contact patch below it, and that tire has a mu n as its maximum friction. You can point that friction force any way you want. So you can point it directly to the right, directly in front, directly to the left, or behind. And you can also point it in combined cases, but its vector sum, if you're doing combined case, will always equal one, or sorry, always equal um, mu n. So that results in a circle. And that's what we get with this red circle. So the red circle is the limit of tire grip, and the tire can be used all for right turning, all for acceleration or any combination thereof, as long as you're not bigger than that red circle. Um, here's, if you're right on the red circle, you are at that limit of the tire. That's the ideal race driver. The successful race driver will be at the red circle at every opportunity. Uh, the casual race driver will be down here or somewhere inside the circle. And the out of control one, well, te technically you cannot be outside the circle because the mu can never be bigger than that. But if you tried to go outside the red circle, you lose control uh, and the tire goes into um, sliding friction. Ah, so that's important. Um, so this is, um, do I want to get into that? Well, you probably learned, I'll keep it simple for now. The, the static co-friction of friction is l almost always less than the kinetic coefficient of friction. Is that familiar? Yeah. So the person who's sliding around the corner, like those drifters, you know, drifting looks awesome, very exciting, not fast, because they're they're dealing with the K, the kinetic coefficient of friction, the, the 
racing driver will keep the car under control in a sliding case. Okay. There's actually there's one exception to that would be ultra tight turns like that uh, maneuverability event uh, where you, you have to rotate the car and there are breaking the rear end can't be faster. Static is the less. Oh. Definitely not less. <laughs> yep. I will make mistakes, so catch me. Uh, so that's the friction circle. That's how you can think of it. Uh, here's like a plot of actual data of a car. So you can see that, um, let's see, so this, the tires limit would be somewhere around here. And then in acceleration, they never, in this case, get to its limit because um, the engine wasn't very powerful or they were going so fast that the gearing didn't let them break the tires loose. So this would probably be a street car. Okay, so that's combined. Any questions on combined um, cases of acceleration braking? Okay. Our next big topic is uh, now we're getting into kinematics of the suspension and kinetics of the suspension. So, kin do you remember the difference between kinematics and kinetics? Did they talk about those terms? So, kinematics means motion. And kinetics means forces. have to do them in order to do the kinetics you have to do the kinematics but the kinetics kind of motivate the kin kinematics so I'm going to do them kind of back and forth so let's see let's look at a couple suspensions I'm going to start with a real simple suspension that's a terrible one but it's a very good model for how suspensions work this is called the swing uh, terminology. It's bad. People use the same term to describe different suspensions. Uh, this would be a swing axle suspension. Um, but some people call swing axle, say the word swing axle, you need something else. But classically, swing axle is this. This is looking from the top of a rear suspension. This was used on the old Volkswagen Buds, uh, the old Porsche 356. Um, the old, the first generation Chevy Corvair, which is why the Corvair got a bad name. Um, Bug 356 Corvair, yeah, I think that's the name ones, and a few other cars. Uh, so, top view, there's the differential. Here's the two outside wheels. Each wheel is on an independent arm that pivots right here. And that's a universal joint right there. So your power comes in, splits, goes to the universal joint down the drive shaft, and, the, and this is all one piece. So, well, mostly one piece. Oh, actually, this is a little bit different. In, in, the, in some cases, they make the pivot be the universal joint. In this particular drawing, they have the pivot a little bit below. But we could just pretend they're the same, it doesn't matter. So each wheel, you can imagine, is pivoting about that point. Okay. So now we've got graduated from go-karts to cars with suspensions. Well, actually, first, why do we have a suspension? Why don't we just make a video go-kart? Because we want to keep contact with the ground. Yeah, yeah. So that, oh, maybe this would be a good time to show that. Uh, no, that's too complicated. Um, right, it, so if your car's a go-kart and you hit bumps, then as soon as you hit the bump, the whole car launches into the air. <laughs> you can't do anything in the air. Uh, you don't have wings, so you have to wait for it to come back down to the ground. Then it bounces on the ground. So on um, flat, perfectly flat um, race courses, go karts are awesome. You know, if you have no bumps, there's no reason to have a suspension. Uh, and Formula One or those aerodynamic cars, um, they effectively don't have a suspension because down, they have so much downforce that if they had a suspension, the car would be dragging on the ground everywhere. So that those cars just have to be smooth in order for them to perform well. But 
off-road, we are in the total opposite situation. Um, we have massive bumps, and we have to deal with them. So, uh, so we have our spring between the body and the wheel. Uh, this wheel's pivoting about here. And you can imagine, so this is looking from the rear, so we're going around a left turn, the car is gonna roll like that, right? Typically. Uh, there's a special case where it won't, but um, in general, it's going to roll like that. We'd like to know how much is it going to roll. If it rolls too much, then that's kind of hard to control, and you know the car feels sloppy. So we want to have a suspension to let the wheels go up and down, but we don't want the car to roll over in turns. Uh, the, the, no, both roll over literally <laughs> all the way over and just roll angle. So how do we understand how? this MA vector up here causes the car to roll. Okay, so first we look at the idea of a roll center. That's that RC there. And I'll show you how they get to why it is there. This is a terrible suspension, but it's the best one to understand roll center. And we'll talk about why it's terrible too. So, let's draw that one. Tire. Tire. Um, axle. Bar. Okay. So for the moment, let me pretend the tires can kind of pivot about their contact patch, then you can now imagine, while this, link, this is um, an axle and a wheel, from a kinematic perspective, this is all one body. And you can imagine that there is a link right there, and that there's another link right there. So this is now a mechanism, a four bar mechanism. Pivot, 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 pivot. The fourth bar being the ground. So let's see, how should we think about this? Um, let me pretend that the tire is pivoting here. If that's true, then this point at this particular moment in time can go that way and that way. right? two directions it can go. Same thing for this one. That can go that way and that way. So if, if we know that about these points, then the vehicle will have a center of rotation defined by these two arrows. Where will its center be? Down in the middle. And what, when you say middle, how shall I find that middle? What's that? Yeah. So if you know that this one is moving that way, that one's moving that way, the only way a solid vehicle can have two points going like that is for it to be rotating about this point. So if I now take the vehicle and I rotate it like that, that point's doing that and that point's doing that. And this is the roll center. you find the roll center of any car is you draw a line from the contact patch to the suspension's um, center of rotation and then you draw another line from the other contact patch from its center of rotation where they intersect that will be the roll center. Now this suspension is awesome for explaining this because this is a real point it exists on the car it's, it's a physical thing. There's other suspensions where this is not a real point, but a virtual point, or an instance point. Uh, and, but the technique ends up being the same. Okay. Let's see. So here it is. Here's that swing axle suspension. Same thing I'm just showing here. 
Um, this was a popular suspension in the 50s and 60s uh, because it was so simple. At the time, center, constant velocity joints did not exist. They didn't know how to do them. So they had to do their axles with universal joints. And if you're going to have a universal joint, why not also use it as a suspension joint? So it's both a drivetrain and a suspension joint. Very simple. That's what Porsche did with his first bug. Um, but it has major problems, which we'll talk about later. Not, they're not very important um, for us. Okay, so let's see. So this is one suspension with its roll center. The front suspension will have a roll center based on its geometry, and the rear suspension will have a roll center based on its. And you can think of the vehicle having a roll axis. That roll axis, typically the rear roll center is higher than the front, but it doesn't have to be. Um, almost always, the center of gravity is above the roll axis. And as long as the center of gravity of the vehicle is above the roll axis, when you go around a corner, that car will indeed roll. Uh, it'll one degree or five degrees um, to the outside of the turn. Let's see, there's another picture. Uh, this one illustrates the important point here is the distance from the vehicle center of gravity to the roll axis. That ends up being called the roll moment arm. That's not going to make sense yet. But, um, let me show you a few pictures so that it will. Well. Oh, I'm in the wrong view. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So here's the classic case right here. Um, so I've, um, don't worry about the kinematics or the linkage, just pretend that the roll center of the vehicle is right there and the center of gravity is there. This vehicle, when it goes around a left-hand turn looking from the back, it will have a center of, it'll have a, um, an MA force pointing to the outside of the turn. Here's the center of rotation, and it will roll to the right. A cool thing is that if you put the roll center higher, if you move that point to the center of gravity, then as this car goes around a turn, this car does not roll. That's a weird idea, but think about it for a moment. Um, let me pretend that there's a different suspension. It's not a, um, I think I can convince you that this is true with a different type of suspension. Let's do a beam axle. A beam axle like that. It has a pivot here. The car is here. So this car does not have any um, wheel travel. All this car can do is roll. And the center of gravity of the car is lined up right with that pivot. If I put a force, an MA force, on that center of gravity, and the pivot's at the same spot, that car doesn't roll. It goes around the corner flat. And even though this suspension is um, got linkages and all kinds of motion. The idea of this roll center is identical to this one. And if this car had a center of gravity lined up with its roll center, this car wouldn't roll either. And that's true for any kinematic. There's 20, 30 kinds of suspensions. Um, the important question is, what's the dimension From the, roll, from the center of gravity to the roll center. What's that, um, what do they call it here? Uh, H, can read it? I'll just call it big H. 
that's the roll moment arm, and that roll moment arm will, de will determine um, the tendency to roll. Another picture, uh, same idea, the moment arm. Okay, uh, so that motivates the idea of a roll center and why it's important. Now let's look at how we get that roll center with more complicated suspensions. So the most common um, front, the most common suspension for a race car um, on the front of the car is called the double A arm or double wishbone or double wishbone short long arm. Um, there's other names for it. And it has a tire that has a linkage in here, a pivot, a pivot, two chassis pivots, and basically two links here and here. So you know, pretend that the car is stationary for a moment. The wheel moves relative to the car about these two lengths. And through a very similar analysis as this one, you can show that at this moment in time, the wheel is moving about what's called an instant center right there. Now that is not a real pivot, it's just a pivot for this moment in time because as soon as we move the wheel a little bit, the instant center is moving as well because he's pointing different directions. That's why it's called instant or virtual. Uh, instant or virtual center. Uh, and so, if you take that suspension and you want to find its roll center, that, that red dot there is, is just like this point here. And so, all we have to do is, I think we've got it here somewhere. There we go. I didn't do this out of order, but here it's like, oh. Um, this wheel has an instant center here. That wheel has an instant center there. So now once you know the instant centers, you forget about the linkage. All you pretend is that this wheel is rotating about that point. And now you draw the same line, the same link I drew there, between the contact patch and its instant center. And then you draw for the other one there. The intersection of those lines is now the roll center for that vehicle. And we got that. That's kind of abstract. Okay. Uh, once you've done this a little bit, you realize that as long as you're working in the straight up and down case, in other words, the car hasn't rolled yet, it's a symmetric system, so you don't have to draw the right side. You just draw the left side, draw the center line of the vehicle, and it's wherever this one crosses the center line, that's your roll center. Okay. Um, let's see what we can do this next. Now let's continue on this double A arm. So for the double A arm case, it's just like before. Here's our roll center that we found from that method. Uh, here's our center of gravity. It's got an MA force applied to it right there. And we have this B, which I called H before. That's the moment arm that's gonna try to make this chassis roll. Uh, we can look at, there's other kinds of suspensions for sure. Let's see, here's a parallel equal length suspension. It's still double A arms, but they aren't inclined at all. Uh, this wheel now has an instant center where? What's that? It's infinity. infinity, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wherever that direction is, over in the hospital. So this wheel is just moving straight up and down, and the only way that can be true is in center and infinity. So you draw a line from its contact patch to infinity, and that would just be along the ground plane. Same thing for that wheel. Um, so your roll center for this vehicle is on the ground.
maybe this is good. This shows you a little more detail about how these are actually formed. Um, tire, rim, that's the hub right there. That's a brake disc. This is called either the spindle or the upright or the knuckle, has lots of names. Uh, ball joint, ball joint, and then inner pivots to the chassis. The A-arm suspension is really nice because it gives you very good control over the roll center. You can put it where you want it. Um, you can also control the angle of the tire as it moves through space. But let me mention a few other types of suspension so we get a feeling of how to deal with them. Uh, so this is called the trailing arm suspension right here. And this is a top view of a rear suspension. This is almost used in a rear. Never, I don't think it's ever used on a front. Um, it has a arm that grabs two pivots here and here. So this wheel will always move straight up and down. And so uh, it is doing an arc as we come out of the board. But um, from a rear view, this has the same um, instant center and infinity as the parallel arm one. And so this one will have a uh, roll center at the ground plane. This is not very popular, but this one is fairly popular. This is used on, um, let's see, first car was, first big car, popular car was Porsche 911 to use this. Uh, later Volkswagen Bugs used this. Uh, the later, um, no, not the Corvera, they did something else. Uh, Porsche 911, Bug, BMWs. BMWs have used this since the 2002. So this is called the semi-trailing arm suspension. And the big difference is that um, this inner point is not directly over, it's here. So maybe you can imagine as this wheel goes up and down, it doesn't stay vertical. It changes its angle, its camber angle, as it goes up and down. The way you analyze this one is you take this line, it goes, you draw it until it hits the axle center line, and that is the virtual uh, center of rotation of that wheel for the purposes of um, um, instant center calculation. So called semi-trailing. The big advantage of this one is that this one had a very short distance between it and the wheel. That means the, the camber, camber is the angle of the tire in this view, um, it's changing drastically with motion and too much. So it would be nice if we could get this point to be further out. And the semi-trailinger is the simplest way to achieve that and still have a pretty simple suspension. it would be awesome if you, if, you're, if you didn't have vertical wheel travel that and all our all we have is cars that roll then that would be fine um, so I actually I do have to talk about why this is a bad suspension it's bad because um, when you put this force on the contact patch that gets maybe you can imagine um, if this is a point and a point and a pivot this is a two force number from statics in a two-force member from statics, the forces in this member have to be directed along its line of action. So this force ends up creating what's called a jacking force there. Oh, I didn't do that right well. Yeah, there we go. So you have your, 
your cornering force. The cornering force creates a jacking force that is um, directed along here. That force gets transmitted right through the link to there. And this force picks the car up. So you might be able to imagine if this car goes around a corner, um, this wheel ends up maybe getting tucked under the car, and the car falls over the wheel. If you don't believe me, I think I'll prove it. The phenomenon is called tuck under. It happened to the swing axle particularly badly. Um, there's a good picture. See that wheel? It's starting to fall underneath the car. Um, there's one. And when the uh, and you can see the rear of the car is raised up, right? So that's the jacking force. It's lifted the car off the ground uh, higher than it should be. And if that continues, and it does continue, let's see if we can find a Corvair. Uh, let's see. See, the Corvair was famous. Uh, Ralph Nader, how many of you know Ralph Nader? You heard the term? He made his name by identifying the design flaw in the original Corvair, which was also true in the Volkswagen Bug. But um, he picked on a Corvair for some reason. We're not seeing it. Trying to win. Unsafe at any speed. Yeah, he wrote the book, Unsafe at Any Speed. And it's because of, uh, oh, there's a good picture of it. Um, it's because these cars, uh, when people took them around the corner, they were rear engines. They, they were naturally tending to uh, swing out in the rear. And they had this suspension that um, t tended to cause the tire to do this. When the, when the tire does this, it has little traction because it's riding on a quarter instead of the tread. And, and the rear is higher. So these things were famous for um, losing control of the rear end. And people died uh, because of that, because they had accidents. Um, so, the problem with a high roll center is that it will always have this jacking force and that will always tend to cause, um, the, not always, uh, for an independent suspension, that is where the wheels move independently from each other. Um, if you have a high roll center, then you're subject to both jacking and having the wheel tuck under. With a dependent suspension, you do not have this problem. You have jacking, but you don't have the tuck under problem. So there's also, um, you can imagine, let's see. Okay, so in the top view, here's, here's one way to do a solid axle suspension. So you could have an A-arm facing the rear. This is, this is top view. If you put that point up here, that's the roll center of the rear axle. If your CG is there or near about, this car will roll very little. Uh, it will have a little, it does have the jacking tendency. But just simply because these wheels are locked together, it cannot tuck under. No way. And so, um, indeed, solid axle um, cars, I can show this picture yeah, there. So the rear roll center on this one is quite high up the ground. And so if it has a solid axle, that's really not a big deal. So independent suspensions, you can't have the roll center too high. Uh, I think streetcars are typically four to five inches on, uh, off the ground for a roll center for an independent suspension. For a dependent suspension, you can have 15 inches. Great question. This will be independent, right? What's that? Baja, this will be independent? Your front will almost certainly be independent. Uh, 
Um, dependent or beam axle front suspensions are terrible. Uh, rear suspensions, that's a toss up. Yeah. Uh, NASCARs are all rear. Trophy charts are, um, are independent, or are, are dependent, with solid axle. Um, the rear suspension, mm, probably the ultimate performance is a little better with independent, but the complexity is way higher. So that's why it's a toss up. Not a toss up, but I'm, I'm, I'm clear. Uh, your, your team will, that'll be a question your team will need to wrestle with. And you're still eating to the whole center field as well. Uh, for the, f not as low as possible. You, if you put it at ground level, then you have zero jacking, but you have a big roll moment, so the car will roll a lot. So the idea is get the roll center, <laughs> we're done. Um, get the roll center um, high enough that you minimize the roll moment arm, but not so high that you have jacking. And so for independent, the um, it seems like around five inches is a good number um, for street cars. For off-road, uh, so off-road, since you have low cornering forces, you probably can go higher. Dirt. So jack and force are automatically less. Okay, so Friday at 3.30. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.